Good afternoon. We will start our uh, Monday, November 10th uh, informational meeting. The first item on the agenda is an update from Deborah Owen, our city clerk. Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. Uh, I know we've been working through this for a couple of weeks, but before you is the final draft, uh, unless I hear otherwise anyway, concerning your legislative uh, priorities for 2009. I believe Breakfast Club is coming up, and so I kind of wanted to get those firm, if, if you will. I'll just read. Number one says, the Sioux Falls City Council strongly encourages the legislature to enact enabling legislation, which allows municipalities to levy a local option tax to raise funds for a specified purpose. Number two, the Sioux Falls City Council strongly encourages the legislature to ensure adequate funding to meet transportation needs. And three, is the Sioux Falls City Council, in conjunction with the South Dakota Municipal League, encourages standards be developed to provide equal 911 service to all citizens and visitors and encourages cooperative efforts to improve 911 services and efficiency. And if I could, a caveat with that, when I did do some email, some course email uh, with Yvonne Taylor, uh, at the league, and um, she had suggested that we, we would mirror their language, and so I, I, I did put their language that is from the governance policy committee. Both Vernon and I sit on that committee, but uh, feel free to change that if you wish. And then finally, number four is the Sioux Falls City Council strongly encourages the legislature to repeal the preemption laws regarding smoking. Municipalities should have the right to use local option to regulate the sale and use of tobacco products. And then I just leave that for later, um, open discussion another time. And then also I sent you uh, just some information, but in the, you know, the council receives this budget and tax news that comes um, every month. And a really neat article uh, is the Upper Midwest is enjoying sudden renaissance of economic freedom. It says the new champ in the upper Midwest, places such as South Dakota, which tops the latest U.S. Economic Freedom Index issued by the Pacific Research Institute and Forbes magazine. Uh, it's an example which doesn't uh, tax corporate or personal income, personal property, business inventories, or inheritances. Jumped, South Dakota jumped 14 spots since 2004 when the index was last published. The state has the second most business-friendly tax climate, according to the Tax Foundation's 2009 business climate. And it goes on to say some very positive things about South Dakota. Um, this is from the Heartland Institute, so it's just kind of an exciting article that's out there for you to look at. And then finally, uh, Council Member Greg Jamison had wanted or requested that uh, there would be um, Bottles available for the council for you to refill if you wanted to drink from these. We know we have the bottled water, which also we, we do recycle those containers as well. But another option for you is this Project Green. Um, every one counts. And so your name's on the back, you'll see. So if you want to use those, uh, you sure can. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Mayor Munson's office. Is there anybody from the mayor's office who would like to speak at this time? Okay, we'll move on with the audit committee. Uh, the only thing I will note on the audit committee is that we have a meeting scheduled for November 25th at 5 o'clock in the outer chambers. And we will also hear uh, a little bit later on from uh, Rich Oaks, our lead internal auditor, uh, regarding our water distribution internal audit. So any other questions, we'll keep moving on then. Uh, fiscal committee, Gerald? No report. Okay. Land use, uh, Kermit, I think you're the only one here from that uh, committee. Well, um... I guess uh, no report. Perfect. Um, public services, Vernon, please. We meet right following this meeting at 5 o'clock in the overflow room. We'll be talking code of ethics, um, city events, block party ordinance, and then security here at the Carnegie Town Hall. Okay, perfect. City Council open discussion. Uh, in a few minutes, I guess we're going to try to connect with uh, Councillor Jameson in Florida at the Municipal League uh, or League of Cities. Um, down there, but prior to that, do we have anything else that we'd like to visit? Vernon? I have three short items. Um, first of all, I want to make you aware that I've uh, submitted a limousine ordinance. Uh, it's a change in what we have currently on the books. Currently, we regulate what limousines can charge. It's very out of date. In fact, the four services in town are charging more than ordinance probably allows anyway. Um, I asked Councilor Knutson to sign on with me. She signed that this morning. First reading would be next week. What it does is strips out the uh, pricing regulations that the city does, um, and it still requires the permit, um, which actually in talking to the four limousine services in town, they, they favor that. Um, they think it's important to continue to have some 
uh, permitting process. So um, I will forward you the, the language that I have, and you can take a look at that. First reading will be next week. Second reading would be in December. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was I wanted to acknowledge Mark Cotter. Uh, I'm sure a number of you probably had a, a lot of emails and phone conversations regarding, regarding the Western Heights projects. Mark has worked very hard to uh, put daily bulletins out there for the citizens to, in those areas to see what's going on, and I think that will help in the communication effort. So, Mark, thank you for that effort. And then finally, we had talked some time ago about the restaurant alcohol licenses. Um, the questions that were out there have been answered, and I would just like to have a discussion with the group to see if we're ready to move that proposed legislation forward. So I'd be open to any comments everyone has on that. Vernon, do you recall uh, in the questions, what specifically did we, were, I, I know we had in issues with the, what the questions and what, what are the answers, because I don't, haven't heard anything from that. Deborah, do you have the, the information that you could forward to all of us? I can. I can tell you that was discussed at length at uh, the Municipal League, and uh, they felt like the, the questions were technical in nature and that they were, an they were sort of asked and answered, uh, some of which are kind of moot now because the, the law has already taken effect. But uh, I will get those and, and get those out to you. Okay. If I could follow up, I, I did check with Lori Hogstead, and there have been some inquiries about those licenses. I've also had some business people ask me about when the city was going to work on that legislation to allow restaurants to get those licenses because apparently there is some interest out there in those. Councilor Knudsen? Um, not on that topic. Uh, sure. Will you finish with that topic? Yep, I think okay. so. Um, I just had a few quick items also is that um, just a uh, friendly reminder to all the citizens listening and to ourselves too that it's this Thursday evening that there's an open house regarding the flood control situation and um, I'll put on my glasses so I can see better but the open house is from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Maricar Community Center which all of you know is attached to Hayward School but again it just is going to um, be an opportunity for um, property owners uh, who are affected uh, by the um, uh, flood uh, plain situation to learn more about the base flood elevation um, maps. So again, that's this Thursday, November 13th, um, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And again, that location is 400 North Valley uh, View Road, though I assume people who live in that neighborhood very much know uh, where that is located. And then, as you know, I am um, the mayor's um, designated person on the um, Sioux Falls Sports Authority, and I just wanted to start uh, marketing a little better um, our um, uh, Northern Sun Intercollegiate Holiday Hoops Fest, which is the basketball tournament that we are going to have at the arena and at the Elman Center this Saturday and, I mean, it's this Thanksgiving weekend, Saturday and Sunday after Thanksgiving. So that's November 29th and November 30th, and I have told you several times before that you can get lots of information about the Sioux Falls Sports Authority by going www.siouxfallssportsauthority.org, and you can find out uh, lots, but tickets are available at, you know, by uh, going through Ticketmaster at the arena, um, by calling Augustana, you um, can um, check with Mike Sullivan, at, um, Executive Director of Sports Authority. Anyway, we have lots of tickets uh, that we want to sell yet, so I uh, um, have a schedule of the tournament for each of you, and I'll be handing that out to you yet today. And then on the um, chronically homeless um, topic, I would just like to remind um, all of you that we are having our next um, site committee meeting this coming Thursday, November 13th at 10 a.m., and at one point I thought I might not be able to make that meeting, but I think I'm going to be there. But I'd love to have any and all of you join us if you can. We need to just keep uh, working away uh, uh, on that important topic. And then some of you may have had this, um, a, a phone call from this particular citizen this afternoon, but a person who lives on South Menlo um, uh, called me today, and I returned the call this afternoon, and she is... Uh, very concerned, that would be an understatement, uh, about the uh, continued expansion of the Sanford campus. And uh, again, she and some others attended the planning commission meeting last week, and we are going to be seeing a, um, you know, an item come before us in the very near future. Um, but she just uh, um, 
you know, wants to know how far does this go? I mean, do we care at all about the integrity of the neighborhood? Uh, why are we not asking Sanford Health to uh, build up as opposed to continually buying houses and, and making parking lots? Uh, she wonders why we don't encourage Sanford Health to encourage its, you know, to provide bonuses to its employees for taking the bus and not creating so much traffic there. Um, anyway, I had a very good discussion with her, and she may have called some of the rest of you, and if she hasn't, I think that she will be. And um, anyway, I uh, told her that I would um, mention her concerns uh, to all of you today. And that's, um, that's probably all I have for today. Any other discussion items? I just have a question. Uh, Deborah. on our resolution of our priorities now, who um, determines the final form on that? I know obviously when we, uh, and it does get submitted at some point in time, it can be amended at a council meeting, but who, yes. who determines this uh, form? Well, all of you do equally. That's why I, I would like feedback from okay. all of you on this. Well, I am strongly opposed to number four, as you know, we discussed last week, so I would uh, appreciate if that were removed. Mm -hmm. That is an issue that is better left at the state level, and I'm, uh, it's the, uh, to allow for a uh, local option on, on smoking laws, and I continue to believe that uh, a patchwork of smoking laws in our, uh, not just Sioux Falls, but Brandon, Harrisburg, T, and that would be a, a disaster for the community. Um, it would create uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages to locations for businesses and um, would, in my mind, and I think the uh, law enforcement officials would back me up, it will put impaired drivers on the road at night for longer distances. Um, on the legislative priority topic, is I think that's a very, very good question that you just asked because, again, as you all know, this is obviously the D. Knutson wish list at this point, and it's only my list. And, and, uh, and I totally agree with Deborah. I mean, I would think that, you know, we would want to decide in the near future what is our list or throw all this away or whatever. But, I mean, that t to me is what uh, – this is a starting point just by me. And, and then for um, – I, I would think that the fairest way to do this as a city council would be for us to – you know, again, um, see if anyone else, we've talked about this about three times now publicly, to see if anyone else has any items they want to add to this and then to actually, you know, actually vote, I mean, vote among ourselves or, you know, just a straw vote or whatever, because if we have, if we have, you know, five counselors that are in favor of any of these or against these, I mean, you know, if they're against these, five counselors are against these, I think they should just go away quickly. So I, I think it is time for us to finalize the list because this is merely my list. Okay. Bernie? I'm trying to remember in past years how we've done it. Did we actually take a vote and do a resolution? This will come in, in resolution uh, to the council. But you're talking about how we did it in our informationals to decide what the priority yeah, was Yeah, did we be. do it just in the informational <clears throat> vote or did we take official action in a 7 o'clock meeting on these resolutions? Well, I think in the past you've come to some consensus. I think, yeah, I think we've had a consensus. And I, you know, it fits my needs, but uh, I would maybe propose that uh, we put in all those that we agree to, and it doesn't seem like the first three are causing any concern, and then if there's uh, ones that are controversial, we leave those out and amend those in that evening. Okay. Do you, uh, Pastor yeah. Costello, do you, mean, do you mean that you think there should be a unanimous support for them? Right, and then if there are, uh, you know, if we, if we unanimously support uh, one through three, we submit that resolution, and then the night of the uh, resolu the, the reading for the city council meeting, if you or if somebody else has a different, uh, wants an amendment to it, we either amend that in on a, on a separate vote. And, and just a question for you, and again, the legislative priorities are not the, you know, a huge deal to me, so I don't well, want you to misunderstand me. I would, why would you want to do it unanimously as opposed to just a majority vote among us? I, I mean, because well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we all agree on anything unanimously. I'm not sure we do. That's a good point. Uh, I, I don't. It just doesn't seem like the first three are causing any anybody any issues. But maybe there are, and if there, maybe we should hear from others that if there are. But um, um, we could do it by vote. I just it would just avoid having a vote in an informational meeting. We'd save our votes for council meetings. And and then just the only other thing I wanted to say we, in um. um um, uh, regarding the smoking issue, which, again, I very much respect other counselors' opinions um, always, um, even um, 
I mean, when they do not agree with me on any topic, that is no problem for me. But I am, um, I'm very encouraged. I'm very encouraged by the polls, the uh, couple of recent polls, and um, by the effort that's underway. Is I believe that uh, I'm really hopeful that the South Dakota Legislature will have the courage this year to uh, uh, ban smoking in. Uh, uh, throughout the state, so it's not a patchwork project in uh, uh, all restaurants, all indoor space uh, protection uh, uh, legislation on uh, uh, all restaurants, um, all bars, all casinos, and um, um, you know, again, the most recent poll was 80 percent, and a recent one in the local paper was 68.2 percent. And you know, I, I mean, I know that the polls don't matter until legislators vote, but I'm, I'm really encouraged that we're going to make progress like the 24 other states around us. Yeah, as a note, Dee, I mean, if this were a, a, an encouraging the uh, legislature to enact a statewide smoking ban, I wouldn't have any objection to it. But, you know, this is a local control issue, and I think that's just a disaster for us. And mm -hmm. I, I, again, I point out, you know, you look at Fargo, Moorhead, or uh, Minneapolis and the, and the suburb communities around there, and the and the pain that they went through on that, it just, it's, it needs to be statewide. Well, Councilor Costello, thank you for that thought, is I would like to right now on the spot change my item number four to exactly what you just said, and uh, thank you for that uh, a very positive um, um, recommendation. Yep. So consider that done. Okay. We'll take that direction, and we'll uh, get it in a final form, and, and off to council leadership to sign and put on the agenda. Okay, and then I will, uh, we had, Gerald and I have a metro, um, management meeting coming up uh, next week or a week from Thursday and so we will uh, we'll run item three by them to see if they have any okay. massaging of that language that they would like to have done as well. Yeah, thank you. How, how long has it uh, been 75 cents a month for uh, Metro Communications because obviously that's a very very critical uh, area for all of us. I'll defer to the, uh, my counterpart who's have longer, longer tenure than I do on that. <laughs> I'm longer tenured, but I have a shorter memory, so <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, okay. It's been a conversation point for a number of years, and uh, as we all well know, that is an integral part of the community's security and safety, and it needs to be uh, modified because, frankly, uh, the community grows, the need for uh, more and more law enforcement grows, and we have not been able to keep up with that with the current budget. Vernon, your the 75 cents D has been since the inception when they, that's the oh. first and only rate it's ever been in South Dakota. Thank you. I couldn't remember that. Wow, I, wow, I really think we're past due. I, I mean, I just think that is a very important, uh, you know, budget item. And my goodness, I just can't think of anything really more important than our 911 service in our community. And I just don't think these services can be provided uh, for the same rate forever. I just don't believe that's reality. Okay. okay, any other open discussion items? Can we uh, get Councillor Jameson on the line? As a note, Councillor Jameson is in uh, Florida somewhere, Orlando, attending a League of Cities uh, convention, where I'm sure he's diligently learning all types of things that will benefit our community in the future. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I can kind of hear you guys back. If you can hear me, I'll just keep talking here and uh, let me know if you can, I guess. I've been, for the last couple of weeks, I've been working with some code issues with a, uh, in a neighborhood where some people have uh, kind of turned into a neighborhood dispute between 
a couple of people. And I've already talked to the mayor's office and Mike Cooper about the issue, and they've met Friday to talk about it. But I wanted to bring it up with the rest of you to see if you guys have seen problems like this in the past. And and the real, the real trouble I see is the idea that citizens have to be the ones who call in and, and file a complaint. And I can understand there's all kinds of problems that come along with follow-up and all, all different kind of problems. But I, but I thought I'd just bring it up to the rest of you guys and see if you've had trouble dealing with this in the past. You guys have all been around longer than I have. And if you see a problem with this, maybe there's a way that we can all work together and create a new program. I don't know. Uh, I guess so. I just wanted to call and bring it up because of the uh, neighborhood dispute that occurred, I really think could have been prevented if the city maybe uh, was a little stronger in their enforcement. And I know those guys are challenged over there in enforcement, but I just think that uh, there's something that could be done better. I don't know exactly what the solution might be, but I figured if we all work together, we could probably all figure it out. But So first off, my question is, have you guys seen a problem like this in the past, or is this just something I'm, because I'm a new guy, I'm just getting schooled on the whole process? Councillor Jameson, um, this is Councillor Knudsen, and first of all, I'm so thankful that you didn't ask about the temperature here in Sioux Falls right now, and we really don't care what the temperature is in Florida. <laughs> but on the more important topic is that, just for starters, is that in an ideal world, um, I would, you know, love to see um, all of our ordinances enforced uh, 24 hours a day by, uh, you know, adequate staff to to do that, however, from a practical standpoint, I mean, from a financial standpoint, I'm talking about, uh, which is a practical standpoint, obviously, is I, I, um, I know in the years that I've been on the city council, a little bit over six, the policy that's been in place is, is again, uh, complaint-based, and like I said, in an ideal world, I wish it were more than that, but my goodness, I'm just not sure what the, uh, the financial ramifications would be if, in fact, we had a whole cadre of uh, code enforcement officers. You know, I mean, we, I just assume we'd have to add many, many city employees. Uh, that I assume the budget would, uh, ramifications would be tremendous to, to do otherwise. So I don't, uh, but I really appreciate your enthusiasm always to, on every issue. Well, here's a thought, and I don't know if it's reasonable or not, because I sure don't understand the whole complexity of all the, things that could occur, but if every city employee that is out on the street, whether it's a cop, I'm sorry, a police officer, a uh, water water department guy who's out reading meters, you know, if they could all be trained, in, you know, public works, parks, anybody who's out and about in the city could be trained in a way that they could recognize code violations. Maybe they were all tied into a central computer system that could they, you know, send in an email that uh, acknowledges that the, they dropped off a warning at this house for this reason and uh, that this term of a warning period will expire at this certain day. And then even if the guy drives by and sees something, he could check on the main system to see if, computer system, to see if that house has had a warning issued to it or if indeed it's time now for a, war a ticket. I don't know if that's an option to empower the rest of all the city employees, even all of us, I don't know if that's crazy, but but I don't want to hire a bunch of other people either, for sure. But, you know, I'm just looking for other options, other solutions than the way it's going along. I think if we just sit and watch these neighborhoods erupt, erupt in uh, could be, would be violence against each other because somebody wants something, you know, another neighbor to uh, move their boat or camp or cut their grass or take a junk car out of the backyard, something like that. I just, I see it happening. I can almost envision it happening where a neighbor, uh, you know, somebody's going to get hurt. And I think it just, we just owe it to ourselves to try to do something. And maybe, maybe we have, and you guys have all done it in the past, and it, there just isn't a better way, but uh, I'm just hoping there is. 
Councillor Jamison, um, this is Councillor Knutson again, is um, um, your, your um, thought. First of all, I think it's always good for us to re-examine every policy, every ordinance we have. I think that's always very appropriate. And your, your questions remind me, it was quite a few years ago when um, then Governor Janklow um, uh, uh, clearly changed the way the state of South Dakota was handling. They were, there weren't like um, code violations per se, but it was, I remember, inspections. And they just, they really did it totally differently than they had done before. And it was cross-training as far as inspectors were concerned. And so people that in the past had inspected just restaurants uh, now inspected uh, child care centers and, you know, uh, nursing homes and whatever. And I remember there was quite a hullabaloo about that. And I don't know how the state of South Dakota is doing that now. And I know I'm not exactly comparing apples and apples. But um, uh, as, as far as your comments, as far as like the, you know, possibility of violence or, or whatever among neighbors, I, I myself in the over six years I've been on city council, I've never ever um, I've never ever been contacted by any neighbor that was that hostile about um, any code enforcement issue. I mean, I, I guess I do believe that our ordinances on the books are very reasonable, and if anything, they might be, uh, you know, maybe in some areas might not even be tough enough, but I mean, but, we, but at least five of us up here agreed to them, including me, and so they are on the books, and so to me, once our reasonable ordinances are on the books, I mean, I do expect citizens to follow them, and if, in fact, they're unreasonable, then I think we should get rid of the ordinances. So I'm just saying I'm, I don't have the concern you do as far as this getting to be really a hostile situation among neighbors. Well, I, I believe maybe this is an isolated incident that could be the case. I just uh, saw it kind of unfold in front of me, and I was, well, in an awkward spot, and I sure didn't want to be in there. And... My thought was that if it is a, a, a code that we have on the books, that maybe we should be the ones enforcing it. So we shouldn't be leaving it up to a citizen to handle it for us. I guess maybe that's the test. If it's really that important to us, we ought to enforce it. And I guess that's that's probably the the real crux of the whole problem, I believe, is that the citizen has to be the one enforcing it. Maybe it's just the only way it can work. I, you know, I, I'm just I'm just stretching here. I'm trying to find a solution, and I'm just looking for your help. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Greg, it's Vernon. Um, hey, Vernon. A couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I'd like to hear what uh, Mike Cooper or the rest of the administration had to say when, when you visited with them about it, if they had any ideas. And then second, I would say we could always um, have a committee dive into it deeper and look at it as well. I, I did just speak with the mayor's office, and they are talking about it. They're still waiting to uh, get information back from some of the people out in the field and trying to come up with other solutions. Um, I let them know how uh, how interested I was in the subject, and and I know they're working on it. And I think in a few days the, the mayor had promised to get some information back to me, and I'll share that with the rest of you. And if... Absolutely. If you think it needs to move on to another committee later on, we could, uh, you know, look at that maybe next week. Uh, Greg, this is Gerald. I guess two pieces to this that I'm a little fuzzy about. Number one, I'm not sure about the incident that you were involved with, but um, I really never had that experience that I can remember for six years. But the other thing is I think there's a big difference between uh, reporting the, ins the uh, concern and enforcement. I think enforcement takes a, a different training method, a different kind of individual who not only understands the laws but can deal with people who are angry, um, understand uh, anger management issues, uh, be concerned about safety issues and all those kinds of things. So I think we got to split that concern or that problem into two areas. Uh, reporting is one and enforcement as another issue. And I agree with Vernon that maybe we need to uh, uh, discuss this in more depth. Very, you know, very good comments. That's exactly what uh, the mayor's office had said, that it's a complex issue. And they even brought up the idea of follow-up as a problem. And I didn't understand that either until then. And I can, I can appreciate the, the complexity of it. And you're right, Gerald, you know, uh, it is a, the enforcement side of it is maybe it's not as easy as I as I kind of look at it and think it might be. 
and it does deserve certain uh, certainly uh, a deeper look if we can. I'd, I'd sure appreciate it if we could. Greg, it's Pat. Um, the only comment I would have is that uh, I wonder if we could, at part of this, we couldn't make the ordinances more effective, uh, maybe by shortening some of the time frames. Because I, I don't, I can't tell you specifically how they are, how they're written right now. But you know, if there's a 30-day warning period, or if somebody gets a ticket or a warning ticket, and and then they, uh, before any action's taken, you know, meanwhile that neighbor or neighbors uh, continue to, you know, get matter and matter about whatever it is that the problem is and maybe there's a way to make those ordinances more effective as well but again if it sure. if it gets to a point where it's a, a heated situation i don't know that we want um, the average citizen or the average uh, city employee in the middle of that mix just like you weren't comfortable with it uh, i would think we we would want you know one of our code enforcement people or or even a law enforcement person dealing with that I would also nope. add to that, Greg, that uh, part of the, the slowness sometimes comes at the courts, too, because following due process, and all of us would love to move that along quicker, but there, there isn't always a solution there. But I certainly think it's worth looking at and evaluating and seeing if there's a better way to do it. Great. Yes, yes. And in this, in this process, I was coming to understand that I think in a normal situation, a neighbor would go over to a neighbor and say, "Hey, you know, you got that junker car out back. Uh, when are you going to move that?" And the neighbor, the other neighbor, might say, "Well, I'll move it when I'm good and ready, and I don't want to move it." Or something else came up, and I just can't move it. And then the other neighbor sits and he stews over it because the car is still back there. And then, and then the neighbor that's stewing, he calls code enforcement. They come over and issue a warning. Well, now this. This one neighbor with the junk car in the backyard fully understands which neighbor it was that complained, and that's I think how these disputes disputes kind of get started. I think most neighbors try to work it out themselves, and then it's hard to hide after you've confronted your neighbor and said, you know, could you move your car out of there? Kind of looks crappy, you know, and then it it just escalates from there and. And maybe there's a magical moment in that process that we could interfere or that the neighbor who's complaining, maybe he just, maybe we just need to let them know that they shouldn't go and try to work it out one-on-one. -on -one. They should just call us immediately. I don't know. Well, I'm going to uh, make the ex executive decision here, and, and uh, I think this probably is a natural for public services committee, and I know that there are a number of events that, uh, the, that committee is dealing with right now, uh, but maybe when uh, is, Councilor Anderson is either on his way down there to join you, I believe, or, or will be soon anyways, but maybe uh, when you both get back, we can uh, figure out uh, a game plan and put that to a committee, my guess is Public Service Committee. Very good. I'd, yeah, anything we can do, I appreciate it, guys. Okay. We'll learn lots and have a good time. <laughs> All right, and I'll try to stay warm. You guys try to stay warm, that is. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Greg. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, the next item, is there any other open D? Oh, you know, just one quick thing that I forgot is when I was downtown today, I saw the huge banner just reminding us all about Winter Wonderland. It doesn't seem possible that it's already for Winter Wonderland, but again, this year the kickoff is Saturday, so the at Falls Park, the beautiful light uh, display, and so this year it's November 22nd is the kickoff, which is a Saturday night instead of the Friday night that it's been in the past, and, and then the the whole area will be lighted beautifully until January 4th. So just wanted to remind you of that. Thank you. Okay, just as a, a kind of a recap to our discussion then, I'm going to uh, uh, bring it up at the mayor's meeting uh, on Thursday about alcohol licenses and, and find out what's going on with that. And then we'll wait for some information from Deborah as well. And then I'll talk it over with Councilor Litz, when he, the council chair, when he's available and about signing that to public services. And we'll get the... Uh, third agenda item approved by Metro Management Council. So if there's any other discussion, if not, we will go ahead and move on to our presentation, uh, which is the water distribution internal audit report by lead auditor Rich Oaksell. Thank you. I just want to uh, remind the council that if you have any input for next year's annual audit plan, if you'd get that to me, um, I'll be meeting with the audit committee here in a couple weeks and I'll have to present our 
list of projects for next year. So if you have something that you want to consider, let me know. And uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, we, um, I just got done writing a report on code enforcement, and we're going to discuss that at the next audit committee meeting, and we'll have uh, um, some information for you about that and also some ideas from other cities that I've, I've gleaned from what talking to other auditors, what they're doing in their city that might have merit here. So um, we'll get on with the, uh, the water distribution audit. You should have received an uh, electronic version of that on Friday I sent out, and then you should have a hard copy in front of you. And I just prepared a few PowerPoint slides as a summary. And we do have some representatives here at, from Public Works and from the Fire Department also. So when we get time for questions, uh, if I can't answer the question, maybe um, an individual from those departments can help us. Okay, we had seven objectives for this audit. Uh, first one, determine if water emergency response and procedures are timely and appropriate. Two, determine the extent to which water meters are recording accurate consumption. Three, determine if unaccounted for water is reasonable given the industry standards. Four, determine if fire hydrants are being flushed, maintained, and inspected on a regular basis. Five, determine if existing distribution system valves are operating properly and being regularly maintained. Six, determine if aging infrastructure is being identified and replaced in a timely manner. And seven was determine if the fixed assets and the uh, inventories are properly accounted for. And uh, before we get into uh, the report, I'd just like to point out that uh, on page two, um, that we made mention of several uh, noteworthy actions I think you should be aware of. And I think the council may be aware of some of these, but I think maybe the public is, is not so aware. Um, recently, our tap water was considered some of the best in the United States. I think it was Des Moines, Iowa, and Austin, Texas, we're the only cities that uh, were considered to have better quality tap water, so I think that uh, reflects well on our, our water uh, uh, personnel and our, our public works department. And number two, the, uh, the unaccounted for water is well below the industry standards. At one time, the industry standard was about 15% unaccounted for water. Um, it's recently been dropped down to about 10%, and I think our most recent was less than 7%, something like six point something. The unaccounted for water is, is is, is sort of a gauge of how much water you're losing through leaks and that sort of thing. You, you, you know how much water you're producing, uh, you know how much you're, you're charging people for, and uh, you come up with a, a percentage, and our percentage is, is very, very good. And also, the, uh, we'd like to point out the efficiency and the effectiveness of the utility maintenance crews. I, I believe at one of these meetings, uh, Councillor Litz had pointed out his uh, experience in his neighborhood when he had a, had a water main break and it was observing the crews out in the, in the cold and in the dark, fixing the water main break. And, and um, our observations of the crews and their professionalism and their efficiency were uh, very commendable. So we want to point that out. And, you know, typically those water main breaks don't occur 8 to 5 on a warm, sunny day. They're usually middle of the night. Um, it's cold out, it's, uh, and uh, they get the job done. So we want to point that out. Uh, we want to focus mainly on, on two of our recommendations. The recommendations are on page 9, 10, and 11 of your report. We have six recommendations, but uh, we just want to uh, uh, highlight uh, two of those. Um, one is that we recommended formalizing and expanding the, the valve exercising program. And what I mean by valve exercising is, is the valves are those, those uh, things that shut the water off in, in, in the supply lines. And uh, typically what happens is once they're installed, they, they never get used unless there's, a, say, a, a water main break and you have to shut off that section. Um, typically around the country, municipal water systems often don't have a, a formal program to turn the valves. That's what the exercising is, is what we're talking about. And what happens is when, when you do have to actually turn the valve, maybe 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, it breaks because there's a deposit of uh, mineral deposits, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what often happens when you, when you turn the valve. So the next thing, you have to go up the, up the stream, so to speak, and find a valve that finally works. And uh, another problem that you can have when, when you turn a valve is you can get a water hammering effect where that, that you can have a rush of water go into the, on the pipes and it can, it can cause damage to the pipes. So oftentimes uh, municipal water crews are very reluctant to turn a valve. There, there's just bad things that can happen. However, if you have a, a formal program where you exercise those valves on a regular basis, you, you, you know that they work. You have, you have confidence that they work. 
And uh, the uh, water department was on board with this. In fact, they have uh, uh, two more FTE positions for next year for utility maintenance. That should help give them some more manpower so they can do that. And they recently purchased some equipment, truck-mounted equipment that, that turns the valve. Uh, instead of having to do it by hand, having to crank it, there, there's a machine that does that. So that should help their, their program of, of, of valve exercising. Um, and the next thing we uh, want to talk about and spend a little time talking about is the private fire hydrants, and that's why we asked the, uh, the fire department to be here. Uh, they're aware of the problem. Water, the public works is aware of the problem. We have about 900 of these uh, private fire hydrants in our system, about roughly about 13% or so. Um, these would be at colleges and universities, uh, gated communities, mobile home parks, that sort of thing, where they're not really owned by the city. Um, and the problem has been in the past that uh, of assigning accountability for who's supposed to be flushing these, repairing these, inspecting these. Utility maintenance will try to get to those if they can, if they're allowed on the property, if they're not kicked off, if they know where they're at. Um, however, the fire department would like to, to recommend that we do an ordinance on that, that we, uh, that we beef that up and then have a, a, a way of enforcing that and knowing that this is being done correctly, that, uh, that the, uh, the property owner is responsible for this, but they have to uh, submit some sort of paperwork to the fire department showing that this has been done and that they used a, a certified contractor to do this maintenance. Uh, the problem is if, if we uh, don't do, address it, the problem becomes, uh, say, down in the future, we could possibly have a, a tragedy where there's a fire. Um, we're not, uh, uh, perhaps the fire department shows up. Um, maybe access is restricted. Uh, they, they have difficulty getting to the fire hydrant, or they can get to the fire hydrant, but it doesn't work properly because it wasn't maintained properly. Uh, so we kind of want to avoid that by uh, presenting an ordinance to the city council uh, and set up some sort of formal program for that. And you can see the response of the fire department on uh, page page uh, 10 and 11, what they propose for an ordinance uh, to accomplish that. So I think that may be one of the most important things we get out of this audit. Um, and at this time, if you want to discuss any of the results, you can ask questions of me or Public Works or the fire department. So we'd be happy to take your questions. Um, thank you for your um, presentation again today. Is that regarding the private hydrants, I do, uh, I find that whole area just really uh, interesting. And I guess I first learned a little bit uh, fairly recently when we were discussing a zoning issue over in that Penmarch area. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, you know, I know Penmarch has a, at least one private hydrant, if not more than that. And I, I guess I just... Uh, I just assumed all the fire hydrants in town were well, city hydrants. Well, I I never heard yeah. of private hydrants. I hadn't either that. until we started the audit. I assumed they were all the city owned them and maintained them, but mm -hmm. obviously incorrect. So, and so then going just a step further, yeah. as far as like uh, city liability is concerned, and you know like insurance ratings and so forth, is um, in, I mean, would we ever want to? I mean. Is this how most cities handle private hydrants? I mean, that, that those places, I mean, like the Penn March neighborhood is supposed to, you know, like, keep up their fire hydrant and make sure that it's, it just seems like, the, it's what I'm trying to say, it just seems like at about the time that a few beautiful multi-million dollar homes burn down, that the buck will stop with us yeah. instead of with them, and that yeah. concerns me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't address what other cities do. I think they, they use a variety of methods of handling that, but perhaps maybe uh, somebody from Fire or Public Works has more. More information on that. So. I don't want to be speculating. In other words, good evening, City Council. Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. Uh, the truth of the matter is, there are um, many different ways communities address uh, private hydrants, and and even in the city of Sioux Falls, there can be situations where the mobile home parks are just one situation where we have. Uh, private hydrants and that's essentially if you drive into a mobile home park in many ways there's a master meter right there at the entrance and so normally just like in your own house that's the um, that's the clear distinction where the ownership of the line is and so from that point on is private and from the other side of the meter is uh, public um, that's that's a different situation in a residential home but on the um, 
private hydrants, as you go into like a mobile home park and there are, there's a master meter, everything in there is considered private. Which means that back in, say, 50 years ago, they may have put in substandard lines, which then also put in substandard um, um, amounts of water that may come to a hydrant. What we want to do every day is, or every year is, to be able to go in and flush, have somebody flush those hydrants, whether it's public works or the private entity. And what's been happening for a number of years is that public works does that work. And of the 900 hydrants, we usually have full access to over 800 of them. And what happened this last year was is you... Um, go on site, and if you identify something that needs to be repaired, we document it, and then we send it to the fire department, and then they make contact with the owners, either by um, certified letter, and then work through getting those repairs being made. And that's essentially what happened this year. Over 800 of these were flushed, and we sent out, I think, about eight work orders, and working with Frank uh, Atayan, uh, he coordinated that work, and that work is well underway. So. The key, it's, it's two purposes. We want to make sure the hydrant is operational. It's also a water quality aspect that when we can back flush those lines, that gets that tuberculation moving and um, it just uh, cleans up the water lines. But we have had some debate uh, internally and also with the IRAB group about really how do we, we've got two options. We either continue to do like we do today, which is to have public works um, flush these private hydrants. And to give you a sense of our timing, it's about three days for 11 teams to go out and flush these 900 hydrants. So for us to, um, and the other option is to privatize it, train contractors, and then have contractors and private entities coordinate with these trained contractors to do the work. Um, where we clearly think that um, it needs to be broke that if there is maintenance that's needed, the private industry should be doing that work. But some of the conversations that I've heard is that there's, there's not enough of those private hydrants to really warrant privatizing. And it's also, you know, from a timing standpoint to flush all our hydrants at once from a cleaning and maintenance data and water quality standpoint, that's better. So um, we're still working through some of those things. I think the key issue is that we got to, that we want to keep in mind is that we want those hydrants flowed every year to make sure that the caps will come off and that the fire hydrant can access them. If there's repairs needed, those repairs need to be conducted by private contractors. Um, and so we'll, we're kind of managing through that. And, and the last piece of that is if that's the route we ultimately go is to continue the way we've done it, just that we have the right of entry to go in. But there will certainly be aspects that if public works goes on a private site, I mean, some of these hydrants can get very old. If one breaks, should that be the cost of the um, water department or should that be private? And, you know, at this point, it's always been the private uh, person, especially when it goes past the master meter. Joe. Mark, when you go in to test or maintain or inspect or whatever you do with these uh, hydrants, do you charge the uh, private property owner a fee for doing that? We don't. Uh, in some communities, they do. Um, but in, in our case, we've... When now, if you approve a, a, a private road that has utilities in it, those utilities now are normally dedicated in a public easement. So the road and subdivision may be private. If you get one that comes in um, next week, but the utilities are normally dedicated by easement. So we already have right, right of entry based on that to go in and inspect, flow, grease the caps, and then leave. Um, so that number of private hydrants like in a mobile home park at least isn't growing from that standpoint. There's, we've obviously got some very, we've got some older neighbor, we've got some older situations, whether they're industrial or mobile home parks. Um, that those situations won't change in the near term, but at least that number's not getting larger without the 
um, private easement as or public easement as aspect. What's happened in the past if, in fact, you go in and do a, an inspection and turn on a hydrant and you strip the gears or whatever you want to call it, uh, what happens? To, is it the private property owner responsible for that equipment or is the city replacing that? Uh, the private property owner is responsible for that. Is there a minimum um, equipment standard that they must live with so that we know that we're going to get proper flows when we report or when we have to go fight a fire? Because obviously we've had legal issues in the past with houses who burned uh, down and uh, the city has been responsible, according to the courts, and that we've had to deal with those issues. So what, what are we going to do to take this to the next step, if you will? Um, well, just recently we've, we've, we've involved multiple departments of the city, including risk administration. We've also had two discussions at IRAB in the last six weeks to just really start to vet through of um, what the situations are, what the options are, and what decisions have to be made. And then I think our next step, I've personally started to call some of the um, owners of these private systems to get their sense of what um, they believe needs to be done just to do that outreach. I think now we're going to have to create a subcommittee and include some of those entities on it and really kind of walk through. Number one, um, if the city is the most efficient means and the best timing to do this, then let's continue to do that. Let's work on right of entry. Let's work on hold harmless. Um, if there is easements needed, let's work on those. Um, Again, the whole goal is, is if, if the fire department has an event, um, they want to make sure that if a hydrant the day after we leave can break for whatever reason. But the reality is, is just with the normal coverage, there should also be another hydrant in very close proximity, three to 600 feet. And so they should have another ability very close to get on another hydrant. So. I mean, I would only say, Mark, that some of those mobile home parks are quite large, and, and you might be dealing with multiple fire hydrants that have never been maintained or there might be a concern. Um, are you, is, is it your intent to take this forward, or is it the fire department going to be moving this forward? Is, is, is there somehow somebody's going to find resolution to this? Um, we're jointly doing it. So okay. Chief Hill and I have worked on it, and Frank's here tonight. Um, but there is... There is work to be done. Um, I think that we have had the ability again to, of the 900 hydrants, been able to go in each year and flow just over 800 of them. And so unless there is, you know, very stringent security constraints uh, that we have at one of the operations in Sioux Falls, the reality is, is we need to just work with some of those property owners that um, don't, in some case, potentially know the full purpose of why we're there and the true benefit, but we will, um, just from a timing standpoint, the length of the discussions, I would say we're, uh, and then going back to IRAB, we're, we're easily probably three months away. Councilor Um uh, Director Cotter is, so like right now, if I, as an individual citizen, if I have if I buy a trader court or I build a development uh, somewhere in our city, can I yet today, um, or can a person today yet can they can they get a um, private hydrant system in, if they want? Is is that still permissible, or has this just been done in the past? That's what I'm trying to say or ask. Um, well, everything is very specific. If you were to put in a um, I think our intent is to really work out some of those details. If one service line was extended for a commercial property based on the length and a hydrant was set there, and then, then that line also immediately goes to in the, into the building, are we gaining an easement on that or not since it only provides for one commercial business? Um, in some situations, no, and that can be something that the committee recommends. It says every... Every service line that has also a fire hydrant attached to it should at a minimum have a public easement that if the direction is for the city to continue to flush these, which I believe just with the timing and the resources we have that ability, um, then let's get a public easement on that. That public easement also then addresses the right of entry, and then we have to work closely with risk administration to make sure that we're, the home hold harmless is in place. 
um, so we can have the overall goal that uh, the hydrants are ready to flow when they're needed. And two other just quick questions is one one when you mentioned you know that there are like nine hundred private hydrants in our city right now and then I think a couple of times today you've talked about that we have like in you know checked out eight hundred so far do you just mean I mean I know do you do you mean that we're having difficulty getting permission to check those other hundred or you just mean we quite haven't gotten to those yet because you know you can only do you know so much and it's only November what did you mean by that that um, it has been a permission uh, item and so that's why um, we haven't gone into those situations and then my last um, question or thought in on much less important than the safety issue obviously is just even the um, like right now is there any policy as far as private hydrants as far as like even just from an aesthetic standpoint standpoint as far as those private um, businesses keeping them painted and so forth and again it's obviously real low on the totem pole for for uh, safety, you know, much lower than like safety issues. Well, I think our, um, that can be part of the criteria if we go back and say, okay, we flowed your hydrant on this particular day. This is the preventative maintenance. We recommend that you have a contractor do, which may address painting, might address um, clearing out hedges that somebody plants close, just so that they're in full view and when uh, the fire department pulls up. So I think that there could be a number of those items added to a checklist that just increases their awareness and their responsibility, understanding, too, that um, every commercial business in Sioux Falls has to have their fire suppression system checked, um, and that is uh, a part of their requirements each year that the fire, that the fire division actually manages that. The, the difference with this is that since that's, an, that's a completely inclusive program that everyone has to do, there has to be several private companies geared up to do those system checks. The comments that I've heard from some of the private contractors that may be candidates that would get this training, they just said there isn't, there isn't enough of these situations to really um, make it make sense to privatize this potentially. So that will also be a discussion with IRAB. Uh, again, we come back that we want to make sure that they're all flowed, the caps are all greased, so when the um, fire department comes there, they're ready to flow in the situation. Mark, on that, um, it seems to me, uh, you know, if it's a private development, say a mobile home park like we've talked about, that if the private individual didn't put the fire hydrant in, that the city would have had to have done it to be able to provide that life safety aspect of it. So it, my first blush at the thing would be that should be, you know, we should maintain them uh, just like we maintain all the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and if we need an ordinance for access or whatever, that to me seems to be the most logical way to go. But I'm certainly open to any thoughts on that as well. But that would be my first indication. Okay. So. Well, we will look forward to hearing from you or Don Hill regarding the progress of that over the coming months. Very good. Are there any other questions for me about the report? Or? My only question is, is, what did you do to get that tie? Did you lose a bet? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's my Victory Monday tie. Oh, you I don't, don't get, get to, to wear, wear very that often. very often. No. no, I don't get to wear that very yeah, often. Yeah, it looks brand new. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Rich. Um, I don't believe we have an executive session uh, scheduled. Is there any other items for discussion from the council? If not, we will adjourn the informational, and the Public Service Committee will commence immediately.